Hello, and thank you all for joining my session. This is one of my favorite talks because, well, we get to do a whole bunch of really fun demos. But anyway, we'll get into that. Before I get underway, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today, including the Waganja people, who are the traditional owners here in Narromine, where I'm presenting from. And Narromine, for those that don't know, is a little country town in country New South Wales. For those that I don't know yet, hello, my name is Developer Steve. I'm one of the senior developer advocates at Sneak. I'm previously, well, I've been in a developer advocate or a developer evangelist for many, many years now for companies like PayPal, Braintree, Vizero, Telstra, and IBM. And well, one of the things I love the most about being an advocate or an evangelist is I get to come and geek out with amazing communities like this one. And in particular, I mean, we all learn and grow and sh well, share knowledge together, which is always great. And I mean, that's that's pretty much the, the main core of open source as a whole as well. So massive open source fan and contributor. And so I've been literally coding since the age of eight, back in the days of QBasic, for those that remember it. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, like open source libraries and dependencies back in those days, or indeed wasn't a whole lot in the form of um, like open source communities. There's a little bit, but I, through what I call my developer origin story, if you will, one of the things I've always loved doing as a, techno a technology adopter and technology enthusiast is just building application that changes someone's lives in so many different ways. And indeed spending time through digital agency and even being a CTO, building an application that just changes someone's life in that tiny little way from being able to order food or a car service or entertainment or just be able to connect to each other. So if you think of like an iceberg and how usually you've got a small amount of an iceberg sitting in the water and then underneath you've got the majority of the iceberg, we can apply a software development lifecycle, LSL, SDLC, in the same type of approach when it comes to de deploying, building, and maintaining applications. Something I've always been mindful of through my developer origin story is just what else is being deployed on, in that stack that I'm releasing my code uh, along with. So if you think of like open source platforms like WordPress, Drupal, for example, or indeed some of the NPM ecosystem components, so many times, like as devs, as technology people, we deploy these applications, which sometimes have some uh, things hiding in them that we're not even aware of. Indeed, through my developer origin story history, there's been so many times where I've had to go back and clean up an application because there was that one component which let something into my stack or let a malicious attacker gain control of my stack, which subsequently had some um, unwarranted uh, things happen inside the, the stack from data integrity right through to running applications, root kits, or whatever else inside my application. And again, if you think like from that whole uh, user first approach, there's times where we will, add, as developers at the code front level, literally just npm install a particular thing or composer install a particular library with little regard to the security aspects of what we're, what we're utilizing and what we're doing. This is where um, encouraging development and developer teams to, to do that due diligence piece of understanding the components that they're using, but also the subsequent uh, indirect dependencies, which they're also utilizing as well. And special mention here too, and like I've been here, usually it's at like 2 a.m where you're looking for a particular fix for this problem that you're having in the code and you find that thing on Stack Overflow or Reddit, that snippet of code, which you're not entirely sure what it does, but hey, things seem to work and now finally you can do that commit and go to bed. So many times where um, I've often then subsequently wondered, huh, I wonder what that's actually doing inside my, my infrastructure. And this is where taking the time to do some due diligence sort of really pays off again, to protect those end users that we build these apps for, which is really, really important because those end users put their trust in us and their faith in the systems that we're building out that we keep them nice, safe, and secure. We keep their data secure. And fundamentally that you don't end up with that really big bill at the end of the cycle because something's using your cloud infrastructure for all sorts of reasons. I've totally been there before. <laughs> But one of the things I love the most about the open source uh, ecosystems is just the exponential growth that we see um, year on year. 
like so quite often there's that be that one um, library functionality that splits off and becomes a dependency that gets used across the holistic ecosystem, which is really cool because I mean that's what open source is about, right? And as product of as a product of the open source world, like the learning, the sharing of knowledge, and the community spirit, that is totally one of the things I love the most. One of the things we do see across uh, ecosystems, though, is also the rise in vulnerabilities being discovered in these very open source packages. And again, if you think back to that iceberg view, your open source code that, or the open source code you're using for your code, which sits above the water or on the surface of the internet, if you will, which is then the second level down in our iceberg view because your code is using open source libraries and dependencies to be able to do the amazing things that it does. Even platforms like Drupal, and I'm not singling Drupal out in any way, in fact, the Drupal security program, shout out to the Drupal security program folks, because they do amazing work and are very fast in patching anything as a community. They will literally all come together and be able to identify a, a, a security research of uh, findings, be able to identify and validate and then quickly move to uh, push out a patch and a release. But this is one of the platforms, open source platforms I've used in the past where one of the libraries or dependencies in the ecosystem has un inadvertently let something into my infrastructure, which then means going back and identifying, cleaning up and yeah, pushing out a release and well, essentially cleaning things up. But uh, this is something we see across a number of different platforms. Um, and again, shout out to the Drupal security folks because they do do amazing work. This is a reoccurring issue now being looked at by governments all over the world. Indeed, um, you know, through last year and this year, we've seen the likes of um, the American government and even here in Australia, the um, Australian government look at ways to mitigate uh, open source supply chain risks and security. So an example of that locally, uh, for, and I love IoT things, but the Australian government is now looking at ways to um, bring in um, some uh, mandatory rules around uh, open source and uh, firmware on IoT devices. If you think like this isn't just commercial devices that uh, govern and help uh, ag things like agri-tech and logistics tracking, mining, for example, this is also consumer-ready devices. So those Wi-Fi light bulbs that you buy for like five or ten dollars now, they're so cheap and they change to so many colors. But the firmware on those, which I mean fundamentally basically have access to your Wi-Fi network. So this is can be becoming a potential attack vector for malicious attackers or malicious vectors to be able to get into your home Wi-Fi and do all have well essentially cause all sorts of mischief. And while that may just be a simple broker connection, IAC security, whole other topic, um, these, the guidelines that the federal government is looking to adopt in regards to IoT devices is what's known as the ETSI standard, which uh, the UK government recently adopted as well. So this is one to totally check out. Actually, I also run the Oz IoT, AUS IoT uh, meetup group, and we've got a security panel in a few weeks uh, with Somebody from the UK government will be on the panel um, who's also worked closely with the ETSI standards. So if you want to find out more about this one, um, total plug here. But if you want to find out more, um, yeah, please yeah, come and join the session. Uh, will be a lot of fun. And also super interesting to see what the standard means, how it's been adopted in the UK, and just, I mean, what it means to con uh, IOTists of all different levels, consumer, commercial, etc. Anyway. Whole other thing, totally tangenting. But open source supply chains uh, security is something we see through the open source world. It comes in through the likes of, and there's loads of examples on this, but it comes in through um, the likes of like, um, as a uh, ind indirect dependency through event stream, which introduced flat map stream in 2018, for example. So this was a, um, a library that got introduced into the NPM uh, ecosystem through a social engineering hack called EventStream. Now, EventStream was downloaded millions of times a week uh, before it was eventually stopped, but this basically created a gateway or a doorway into um, so many iceberg stacks all over the internet. 
But it, it didn't stop there because we saw Electron Native, very similar type situation, but we saw Electron Native notify in 2020, which basically added a dependency to a library. And three weeks later, we saw the same thing again. And three weeks after that, we saw the same thing again. Each time the community would come together, identify the risk, uh, do a release candidate, we'd see the same injection or same type of injection then uh, occurring for a multiple of weeks. This actually reached a point where the uh, NPM um, organization or NPM group themselves put out an alert to say, if you've got this installed, you need to check your infrastructure pretty quick. So this has been a reoccurring problem and has so many flow on effects to, well, kind of everything around us from utility companies, even on the supply chain, the um, supply chain side of things, everything from utility companies to food distribution networks, like so much um, so much downstream of this, which is why, I mean, governments are taking that move to try and protect these this infrastructure from becoming vulnerable. I want to do a shout out here too, because um, oh, I, I'm a big open source enthusiast. You probably guessed it, I may have mentioned it. But um, one thing here is to recognize like the, the work that these, these open source community groups do and largely they're um, passionate open source enthusiast volunteers that will you know contribute what time they can to the work that these groups do so uh, patching security bugs for example there's sometimes a delay in the security researcher raising a vulnerability with that community group the group then coming together identifying the risk um, putting a strategy together on like how they're going to mitigate it push out a release candidate which then needs to go through testing there sometimes can be a delay from uh, uh, sometimes a few days up to sometimes a few years before um, before the uh, security vulnerability is acknowledged and then a fix goes into place. So remember, always remember, and I know you will do this, I just like to highlight it, but always remember to contribute back where you can, particularly if you're using a particular library or dependency or just the work that somebody's done in the community, contribute back where you can just to, um, you know, add to the project and uh, be be awesome. I know you all do, I just like to mention it. And one of the ways we do that at Sneak is through a program called Sneak Advisor. So basically this allows developers to be able to do some due diligence or technology adopters to be able to do some due diligence on the components that they're using. And in this, in this, um, in this report, you can actually see for a particular uh, open source group, you can see all the metrics around uh, number of contributors, like security things being patched, um, which gives you an overall package health score, as you can see on the screen here. So this is a good way to understand the components that you're using. And likewise, this also gives the community an idea on how they're tracking as far as, you know, keeping on top of vulnerabilities coming in, the number of contributors. And then if needed, the community can come together and um, sort of patch a whole bunch of stuff or put more for more effort or do a call out to be able to get more people involved. So actually, if you are looking to get involved in some projects, this is a good way to work out which ones to get involved in and totally contribute back where you can, even if it's just updating a readme or indeed just checking a um, you know, release candidate fix that might be fixing a security vulnerability. Also shout out to the uh, security researchers that contribute to the Node.js ecosystem vulnerability disclosure program that we also help manage as well, because I mean, fundamentally this keeps everyone nice and safe. Anyway, let's have a look at some apps. You ready to hack some apps? I have two that we're gonna be looking at today. So um, fingers crossed they both work. No, they both will work. They both will work. Anyway, this first one we're gonna look at is one for, it's an NPM app, demo app that we have on the Sneak GitHub. So as you can see here, you can um, you can try this yourself at home. Just please remember to don't take this to the production because it does have 61 known vulnerabilities in there. Now this is totally intentional. Again, not for production. Please try this at home. But um, these are intentional because fundamentally, as developers, technology people, if we understand the vulnerability at its core, most base level, we're able to well, we're able to not only uh, mitigate that particular vulnerability type, but we can spot them easier in future because, well, we know what to look for. We know how they work. So in the repository folder, uh, exploits folder, you'll see here there's a whole bunch of exploits to try on this particular demo. 
this particular one demo app is a to-do app. So really basic to-do app, which you can run in Docker container, you can run on infrastructure. Although again, not really recommended, don't take this to production. And I'm gonna show you why. Actually, I'm gonna show you why on both ones, but in particular, this one. Um, so the um, vulnerability we're looking at today on this demo is the marked package, which basically, well, it's a cross-site scripting attack, but inside the in user input, it basically enables Markdown to appear inside the, well, the user entry, so the user data. So as an, uh, as an entry, I can basically go, this is a bold statement. And yes, it is. Actually, it's a partially bold statement. But anyway, <laughs> the um, thing that I can do with this as an end user is, well, I can basically use Markdown to create to-do list item entries, which is kind of cool, kind of fun. And you can you can do a few things with Markdown. Um, the library that we're using, so the library version that we're using is 0 0.3.5, which you can see here in the package manifest. The oh, wrong window. The safe ones to use is 0 0.3.1 um, and anything below 0 0.3.6, as you can see here. So we're using 0 0.3.5 because I like to live dangerously. So one of the things you can do with Markdown, of course, is links, which looks something like that. And essentially that's going to behave exactly as intended because, well, I as a as a input user or as a developer for this particular application, I want users to be able to enter links. And if I hover over it, like it's gonna take me to the intended destination, um, nothing untoward there. What's actually happening as part of the Markdown library is it's trying to do some user uh, input sanitization, which you can see here inside the application. So I can set sanitize true, um, to, well, sanitize to true as part of the call for the library which is, uh, as, a, as a developer, I mean, you, we always should be sanitizing input. So, uh, I mean, this this kind of should be set to, by default to true. It probably is inside the documentation. Actually, I think it is. But what is actually happening is, as part of the sanitize um, function functionality, is it's doing a whole bunch of character set matching to try and identify any untoward in user input that we don't want to see inside our application which is pretty important, um, not only for um, output input, then output that's gonna appear in the user's browser, but also if you were storing this inside a database, you don't want certain types of things to be injected into that database. So like SQL injection, for example. So in the case of this particular example, what it's doing is doing some regex and then also trying to match put certain character types that we do not want in the user database. Of course, one of the attack vectors we see particular to a um, cross-site scripting attack is then using that same link functionality to try and inject some JavaScript, which is a classic like OWASP attack vector method. And you can see there, like the, in trying to inject JavaScript inside a, a link, a markdown link creation, it's not able to do it. So it literally has, creates a blank line as part of the user input. The other way to get around this particular um, attack vector is by URL encoding characters as part of the um, JavaScript uh, injection attempt. So as you can see there, I'm using the same type of input or same type of uh, attack vector approach, but I've got some URL en encoded character sets as part of the user input, which um, of course the library sanitize function is able to detect that and it's able to filter that out. This particular vulnerability though is using, or well, the way to get around it is to use um, an object type as part of the user input. So in JavaScript, using this, for example, as part of the, um, with URL encoding as part of the input type is one way to get around, well, that's basically how this particular vulnerability works. So if I enter that now, you can see that's actually worked and that now becomes clickable and is able to call a JavaScript function like an alert box. So if I click that now, you can see it comes up with this alert box is alerting inside an alert box. And yes, it is. Now there's a number of ways that a malicious actor would be able to use this particular function. Um, in particular with a browser, browser input like this, like um, loading in, stealing session information or loading in a keylogger, for example, redirecting to a malicious website to do a whole bunch more damage inside the user's browser 
there's uh, a, a number of different ways that this particular function can be used to do all sorts of mischief. Anyway, let's have a look at another one, this time using Java. Any Java fans in the room? Woo, Java. So um, again, this is another demo app that we have on the Sneak GitHub. And please, you can try this at home. There's full instructions on how to get this up and running in your environment. Just like before, we also have an exploits folder. So you can see there, there's a whole bunch of different um, exploit types that you can play around with as part of this uh, demo application. So this time we're running inside Heroku. Um, and what we're doing is using the zip slip vulnerability as part of the zip slip uh, zip util library. And we've got a really good write up on this on the sneak blog, which talks about how this particular vulnerability works and how it basically gets executed. So again, the zip file that we're going to upload is sitting in the exploits folder uh, inside the Java Groove app on the GitHub. Um, but essentially what this is, and I'm just going to sign in. There's a few really good um, oh, demo screen. I think should have worked. Let me switch back, sign in. Okay, there we go. That should work now. Oh, send me live demos, what can go wrong? Um, so uh, just like before, this is a basic um, to-do app. Of course, this um, the slight difference to the other one is there's a, a login with a couple of vulnerability types in there too that you can play with. So what I'm going to do is create a to-do list item entry. So demo to-do. I'm going to set the date to random date, which is a 1970s date. Woo, 1970s. And you can see there, it's just added to the to-do list, the demo to-do entry that I literally just created. So one of the things I can do with this application is upload files, as you can see in the upload files section. What we're going to do uh, is grab that uh, zip slip zip <laughs> such a tongue twister and basically upload that and inside here is where my attack uh essentially well here's where it is where it starts to get interesting because inside that zip file we've got a good dot text file which i mean sounds good that's relatively good but also you'll see the second file is a massive file traversal and essentially we're going to inside the app replace the native to ascii function inside the application so you can see the native to ASCII function here um, as part of the application. And what that does is that user, that to-do input that we just did, we're basically going to hijack that with um, something a little malicious. So if I choose that zip file, like so, and click upload, you'll see inside my files now, I have the good.txt file as anticipated. Now, if I go and try and create another to-do list entry item, so if I go testing, just do testing again, there we go, and do a create, you'll see now instead of testing again, it's come up with more ha ha, gotcha, which it totally did. And so that's that's this particular vulnerability for the uh, zip util library or what we're leveraging in the zip util library is to basically hijack base functionality inside the application and do some malicious things. Of course, all that we were doing was hijacking the user input in this example, but there's a number of ways you can use a file traversal to edit files, take control of infrastructure. Indeed, I've seen file traversals before in the wild where um, whole infrastructure or applications have been hijacked and all sorts of rootkits and malicious activity was going on. Again, this is something like you want to avoid because, well, you've got to protect those users, but also it's going to send your um, cloud usage through the roof, which, I mean, nobody wants. Nobody wants to be on the end of that, that particular bill. Um, switch back to the demo. So again, this is about protecting, doing, taking the time to do some due diligence to protect those end users and protect your infrastructure. Like end users put so much trust in the applications you're building out and supporting. We need to take the time as technology folks supporting these applications, earning their trust to and earning those end users trust to make sure they've got a nice, secure and safe experience. Of course, in the cloud native world, like your application is way more than your code. And one of the things I love most about the cloud, cloud native world as a dev, as a DevOps, as a DevSecOps, is I can deploy applications super, super fast using very few lines of YAML, for example. 
So if we look at um, Docker and containerization, there's been over 242 billion downloads of base Docker container images to date from Docker Hub. And this forms the next part of our iceberg is the containerization piece of our SDLC iceberg view. And if you think about it, like there's so many vulnerabilities that we now see appear in the top 10 Docker base images consistently year on year, which kind of makes sense given what we just looked at with um, open source components, how vulnerabilities can surface in them. It kind of makes sense that we also see the same vulnerabilities appear in base Docker container images. The way to get around this with a base Docker container image is not only ongoingly scanning those base images, but also starting with the base possible minimal image and building up the components that you need or that your application needs as part of your deployment. Again, we need to keep those end users safe and keep that infrastructure nice and safe. The way I like to think about this is with great containerization comes great responsibility. Oh, I do love that meme. And the final piece of our iceberg is infrastructure as code, which, well, it enables me as a dev to be able to build out some really quick and fast um, infrastructure as I need it to appear, as I need it to appear to run my application. But of course, one of the ways that we see um, vulnerabilities appear in things like IAC is misconfiguration being the number one cloud vulnerability type, which kind of makes sense when you think like all the ways that you can set permissions and different um, control different aspects of the infrastructure. But we missed a really important piece to our whole, like our whole iceberg view. And it's probably one of the most scary, well, I'm gonna say that as a developer, as a long time developer, is development environments are now also prone to the same vulnerabilities that we've literally just been talking about. Now, I won't go into that in this one, but um, we have seen the likes of, for those that are familiar with it, Homebrew, we're now seeing the same vulnerabilities appear in the Homebrew ecosystem, which again, kind of makes sense given that um, a lot of the components Homebrew uses for its extensions and indeed its core infrastructure are built from the same open source components that we see time and time again, um, vulnerabilities appear in. Um, something we did release some, um, and there's a full write up on the, on the link on the, on the slide here, but we did release um, also for the VS code or uh, Visual Studio code ecosystem extensions that we're now seeing vulnerabilities appear in as well. Now this gets kind of scary because there was four, um, four extensions in particular that we identified. Now, important to note, um, the maintainers of these repositories have already um, patched the security findings that we've released because we raised a security issue, uh, researchers released, raised security issues on the repositories. So thumbs up to the maintainers. But um, Latex Workshop, uh, open a default browser, instant markdown. And I hadn't used this last one, but I swear it's real. Uh, Rainbow Fart, uh, just some of the VS Code extensions that we've seen um, vulnerabilities appear in. So, there's full write-ups on the blog there, and if you check out my GitHub, uh, uh, my GitHub repo, I actually have a demo for instant markdown, which is probably one of the most scary out of that list. Essentially, the instant markdown vulnerability in the previous version allows someone to do a file traversal remotely on a developer environment. Anyway, not going into that one now. So just in closing, some takeaways. Remember to always be scanning source code, containers, infrastructure, um, make sure you're scanning at that code front level, even if you have a nice um, IDE extension that you get installed or that your devs decide to use so that you can understand the risks on the code that you're not only deploying, but also um, just be identified um, ongoingly of stuff that's coming up that you uh, beyond deployment because super important to be alerted when new things are identified. Just finally, just gonna do a shout out for what did, uh, the Sneak Ambassador program we recently launched, looking for more people to get involved with that. It's free to apply to, and we can help you with um, speaker training or resources or whatever you need um, to be able to go out and well, basically build awareness for uh, keeping everyone nice and safe, like end users, developers, et cetera. So if you wanna find out more about that, hit up the link on the screen or reach out. Uh, yeah, you can reach out to me on socials. I'm developer Steve pretty much everywhere. And just finally, please remember to use your tech superpowers for good and remember to be excellent to each other. Thank you very much.